This is Bloomberg Law. What does a prosecutor have to prove in order to get a RICO conviction? Tell us why the Solicitor General is sometimes referred to as the 10th Justice. Interviews with prominent attorneys and Bloomberg legal experts. That's Jennifer Kay for Bloomberg Law. Joining me is former federal prosecutor Robert Mintz. And analysis of important legal issues, cases, and headlines. Is the toughest hurdle for prosecutors proving Trump's intent? Alito took on Congress, saying Congress has no power to regulate the Supreme Court. Bloomberg Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. Welcome to the Bloomberg Law Show. I'm June Grosso. Ahead in this hour, the fight over the abortion pill is coming up at the Supreme Court. Alec Baldwin is trying to get his trial for involuntary manslaughter dismissed. And the senator who loves to trip up judicial nominees with pop legal quizzes. Since the Supreme Court stripped federal abortion rights in 2022's Dobbs decision, pill-induced abortion is now the most common method for terminating a pregnancy in the U.S. Next week, the justices will hear arguments in a case that puts them back into one of the nation's most bitterly contested issues, setting up a ruling in the middle of the presidential campaign. The court will decide how available mifepristone, a widely used abortion pill, will be in this country. More broadly, the case will test the power of federal judges to overrule the Food and Drug Administration on the safety and effectiveness of pharmaceuticals and medical devices. Joining me is Madeline Mecklenburg, Bloomberg News, Texas legal reporter. Madeline, start by telling us about the decision of the district court judge in Amarillo, Texas, a conservative legal activist. So judge shopping going on there. That's right. The, this case was before Judge Matthew Kaczmarek in Amarillo, which is a single a single judge district. So if you file a case there, you're virtually guaranteed to have it go before him. And it was brought by the Alliance Defending Freedom, a Christian legal advocacy group. And they basically sued the FDA and said the agency didn't follow appropriate protocol when it first authorized the use of mifepristone. And they didn't study the safety and they made a politically motivated decision to let it go to market. And the FDA refuted that uh, during a hearing in Amarillo and said they reviewed the evidence, medication abortion is safe, and every decision they've made about it was supported by science and research. Uh, But Judge Kaczmarek sided with the Alliance Defending Freedom, and he essentially said that he revoked federal approval of mifepristone, which would have fundamentally changed the landscape of abortion in the country. Um, but until it was appealed to the Fifth Circuit. All right. And so the Fifth Circuit, which is the most conservative circuit in the country, tell us what they decided. That's right. So the Fifth Circuit got the case, and they essentially said that since mifepristone was first approved by the FDA in 2000, so decades ago, they couldn't go far enough back to change that decision. But what they could do was roll back access to the drug that the FDA had approved in the intervening years. So in 2016, the FDA had shifted the window for use for the drug from seven weeks to 10 weeks through pregnancy. And then more recently, they said the drug could be prescribed through telemedicine and sent to patients through the mail. The FDA, or excuse me, the Fifth Circuit essentially said that those new decisions by the FDA could be rolled back. And so they preserved access to the pill for now, but with serious limits. And it seems like a lot of abortion cases start in Texas. Do they have strong lobbies there? That is a great observation and very accurate. I mean, Texas lawmakers, I think, for one, have are, are, have led the nation for a while in pursuing some of the mo- most aggressive abortion restrictions. You'll recall this is where lawmakers passed a bill known as Senate Bill 8 that essentially outlawed abortion before Roe v. Wade had been overturned. So I think we're seeing a lot of of motivation from the lawmakers and the citizens here. But we also do have a deep bench of conservative judges and Texas cases go up through the Fifth Circuit. So things that happen here, it's you're guaranteed to go before a friendly judge who's going to put a ruling in your favor. Thanks, Madeline. That's Madeline Mecklenburg, Bloomberg News, Texas legal reporter. Joining me now is Greg Storr, Bloomberg News Supreme Court reporter. So tell us, the Supreme Court accepted this case. Tell us what the parameters of the argument is going to be. 
Yeah, the, the Supreme Court pretty much had to accept this case because the Fifth Circuit decision would have put significant new restrictions on mifepristone, the abortion drug. It would have uh, basically put put uh, things back where they were in, before some changes uh, to, to widen access in 2016. <clears throat> so at the Supreme Court, the, the case is all about those changes that started in 2016, and, and uh, th- that includes making mifepristone available by mail. Uh, in, it, there previously was a, a requirement that uh, someone would have to, to go in to get it uh, to a, a doctor's office to get it. Uh, that is no longer the case, and that is one of the issues and probably the most consequential change being challenged in this case. So there's a question of standing. Basically, do the plaintiffs, a group of anti-abortion doctors and organizations, have a stake in the outcome? I mean, could the whole case turn on standing? It, it certainly could. And in fact, the, the Biden administration's brief spends more time talking about standing than it does about the, the underlying issue about whether the FDA scientific judgment can be questioned. Uh, the, the, the argument is basically that these doctors and these groups are making is, hey, because of the, the liberalization of mif- mifepristone, there are going to be all these side effects, and we inevitably are going to be treating uh, women with those side effects, um, and, and that's the harm that we're suffering. You have to show, show harm to to, to, to show standing. And the Biden administration and uh, the manufacturer say on the other side that that is way too speculative, too many chains in that chain of causation there, and that's not the kind of uh, case or controversy the Supreme Court uh, is capable of deciding. So it is certainly possible the Supreme Court will agree with the administration on that issue and never get to the underlying question about the FDA's assessment of, of mifepristone. Of course, then the case may come come back to the Supreme Court in a different form? It could. Now, of course, you have to find somebody who does have standing in order in order to, to challenge it. Um, uh, we don't want to, you know, never say never, but but that's, um, you know, that could be could be a challenge. There is an issue involving whether uh, sort of lurking in the background about whether a state might be able to to, to press a challenge. The Supreme Court has allowed uh, states to to challenge administration policies in a variety of other contexts. So that potentially could be could be the way to it. And Undoubtedly, the court will be cognizant of that that possibility if they they do uh, rule on standing grounds. And the Supreme Court did issue an emergency order keeping mifepristone fully available over two dissents. Yeah, exactly. Justices Alito and Thomas, two of the most conservative justices, were the dissenters. The Fifth Circuit decision that uh, Madeline mentioned and, and that I alluded to was set to kick in, and the Supreme Court put that on hold until it could decide whether to take up the case and ultimately decide the case. Uh, that that was, uh, you know, it's going to be more than a year that that stay has been, been in effect from the Supreme Court, so um, the, the court does not seem to be in any huge rush to uh, to, to let the lower court's restrictions go into effect. Whether that uh, means anything in terms of the ultimate outcome, we'll have to see. Bloomberg Intelligence analysts are giving a 60 percent chance that the Supreme Court will reverse the Fifth Circuit. So do most people that you talk to, most legal experts, feel that it will be a reversal as well? I, certainly, uh, there's a pretty broad consensus that there's a, a, a real chance, a, a significant chance that it will be. And, and you know, the fact we've obviously <clears throat> seen this is a court that overturned the constitutional right to abortion, um, but this is a completely different legal issue. So uh, certainly, one should not assume that because the court ended up on the anti-abortion side in that case, uh, that it's going to do so in this case as well. Greg, have there been tons of briefs from amicus or a few? you uh, there, there have certainly been a lot. I'm sorry I didn't count them beforehand, but, <laughs> but dozens for, for sure. A uh, very closely watched issue, uh, both you know groups on one side or the other of, of the abortion fight and pharmaceutical companies uh, and, and their, their uh, trade group, Pharma, uh, very, very interested in this case because they are concerned uh, that if the FDA's judgment can be second-guessed in this case, that um, it, it could be in other cases as well, and it could affect their bottom lines. So the Supreme Court has also agreed to consider in in April whether hospitals can perform abortions in emergency situations, even in states like Idaho that have near total bans. 
Yeah, this one has flown under the radar in part because the court agreed to hear this at almost exactly the same time late on a Friday afternoon that it agreed to hear the, the, the Trump Colorado ballot case. And so everybody mm-hmm. was focused on that. But yeah, this is potentially uh, very, very important. And if you're on the side of abortion rights, this might be a, a place where uh, you, you should be, might want to worry that, that abortion rights will be uh, rolled back further. Um, <clears throat> this has to do with this federal law that requires uh, hospital emergency rooms to treat somebody who comes in with an emergency condition. And the question is, is what happens in a state that has a near total ban, like Idaho's ban, uh, makes an exception only when uh, the mother's life is, is threatened and, and need an abortion, abortion to, to, to avoid a risk to, to the mother's life. Uh, and so the question here is, well, what if somebody comes in who has a, a serious risk to her health, but not necessarily a life-threatening condition? Uh, can the doctors, should the doctors perform an abortion in that situation? Uh, lower courts are divided on this issue, which is why the Supreme Court uh, has agreed to take it up. And, you know, at the end of the, the term, we're very likely to have, or we will have two uh, pretty significant abortion decisions. Should abortion rights activists be concerned that the court said the law could take full effect in the meantime, before the arguments, before the decision, blocking a trial judge's order that had ensured that hospitals could perform the procedure in medical emergencies? Yeah, that was very striking. Now, you, you always want to have a cautionary note to read too much into to, to, um, emergency actions like that with the, the Supreme Court. Um, but that was pretty striking because the Idaho law had been on hold in these emergency situations uh, for, for quite some time. And so the Supreme Court changed the status quo when it did that, and it certainly didn't have to do that. So um, if you're on the, yeah, if you're on the side of abortion rights, that is definitely uh, one of those things you put on your list of reasons you might be worried about this case. Thanks so much, Greg. That's Bloomberg News Supreme Court reporter Greg Store. Looking for legal research? Whether you're an in-house counsel or in private practice, Bloomberg Law gives you the edge with the latest in AI-powered legal analytics, business insights, and workflow tools. With guidance from our experts, you'll grasp the latest trends in the legal industry, helping you achieve better results. For the practice of law, the business of law, the future of law, visit BloombergLaw.com. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, actor Alec Baldwin is trying to get his trial for involuntary manslaughter dismissed. I'm June Grasso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grasso from Bloomberg Radio. Alec Baldwin is set to go on trial July 9th in Santa Fe, New Mexico for involuntary manslaughter for the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins, who was shot and killed when a live round from a gun held by the actor fired on the set of the film Rust. But with the clock running out, his attorneys are basically saying, not so fast. And they're asking the judge to dismiss the indictment due to prosecutorial misconduct. Baldwin has maintained from the start that he is not responsible for the death and that he did not pull the trigger. I, I would never point a gun at anyone and pull a trigger at them, never. never. That was the training that I had. You don't point a gun at me and, and pull the trigger at The film's armorer, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter on March 6th for her handling of the gun. Joining me is former prosecutor Joshua Kastenberg, a professor at the University of New Mexico Law School. This has been shall we say, a confusing prosecution. Baldwin was charged, then the charges were dropped, then new charges were brought. And now Baldwin is asking the judge to dismiss the case due to prosecutorial misconduct, saying, quote, the state prosecutors have engaged in this misconduct and publicly dragged Baldwin through the cesspool created by their improprieties without any regard for the fact that serious criminal charges have been hanging over his head for two and a half years. What are their chances of getting this dismissed based on that? Well, um, very, I, you know, nothing is nothing is out of the question, but I would say um, not very high. I mean, the chances are not very high of that. First of all, 
prosecutorial misconduct usually falls into the form of um, deliberately hiding evidence, uh, ignoring that witnesses are going to commit perjury, ignoring witness misconduct, making public statements that are patently untrue in an effort to prejudice a jury. I mean, look, I, I think you can say at the very beginning of this of this matter, the, the prosecution of Mr. Baldwin, the initial prosecution team, was not up to snuff, and they made some critical errors in judgment. But there's a fundamental difference between negligence or even incompetence at the one hand and intentional misconduct on the other. And I don't think that prosecutorial misconduct is at play here. We've discussed this before. From the start, Baldwin has said he didn't pull the trigger. The prosecution's gun expert testified that the gun could not have fired without pulling the trigger. And the defense claims in this motion that one of the state's, quote, purported firearms experts' testimony omitted several essential facts regarding the testing, including that the FBI testing established that the gun did fire without a trigger pull when the firearm was fully loaded with six rounds as it was on the day of the incident. Why does it matter if he pulled the trigger or not? Well, it's a pretty heady accusation that they made against the um, the firearms expert in the first place. And when I say heady allegation is that firearms experts, like any other experts, are allowed to opine as to their opinion and do so in a manner that normal witnesses can't do. And the other side is certainly entitled to bring forward a witness or two uh, to contradict the expert um, and also to slash the expert with cross-examination. But Uh, The accusation made against the expert needs more facts for me to say that the accusation actually holds any water at all. Now, why does it matter? Um, Ultimately, it may not matter. It may not matter for two reasons. One, if this goes to trial, one is that Mr. Baldwin gets acquitted and the jury considers that the expert was in the wrong or unreliable or the evidence wasn't all that compelling. Um, So that's one. And, And two, It's possible that the jury would say that the issue of whether the trigger or not was depressed is really just tertiary, meaning not all that relevant to the uh, issue of criminal negligence that is being charged in this case and the involuntary um, homicide. The trial of the armorer gives the defense a preview of Baldwin's trial to a certain extent. The jury found she was negligent in her responsibilities, that she didn't check the gun properly, and there was evidence that she brought the live ammunition on set. How can Baldwin use that at his trial? Well, that's actually a great strength to Baldwin's case. I mean, in the first place, if he assumed and had no reason to believe otherwise that the only bullets that were available to be used into that gun were blanks, were stunt bullets, uh, and he would not be in a way to know that there were live bullets around heightening the need for, you know, additional or extra safety precautions, that's relevant evidence that can come in, in my opinion, for the defense. And it strengthens, you know, it strengthens his case against the prosecution. Uh, On the other hand, the prosecution can return fire, so to speak, and say, look, that doesn't really matter because people can be killed by blanks and harmed by blanks as well. Prosecutors have argued that Baldwin failed to observe firearm safety measures. He was the star, the producer, and the authority on the set. Last year, the district attorney said he had a duty to ensure that the gun and the ammunition were properly checked. But the union representing film workers, SAG-AFTRA, said that was wrong and uninformed and that an actor's job is not to be a firearms or weapons expert. Yeah, I, I suppose you can, they, you know, the defense can try to get industry standards in to evidence. But the one sta- but but industry standards, movie standard, you know, the movie industry standards are not the law. They're not regulations. They're what typically goes on on a movie set. And it seems to me that the union is only focusing on the duty of an actor. And, you, you know, there's a general... <laughs> There's a general law here at play, and no amount of you know industry practices, whether it comes from the the movie industry, whether it comes from you know used car sales, um, rental cars, firearm sales, uh, or, or pyrotechnics for the Fourth of July, 
can overcome what the basic law, you know, the duty of care is under the basic law of the state of New Mexico or any other state for that matter. So it's not the most compelling evidence. And it, like I said, it tends to focus on the actor, right? And Baldwin had a greater role than just being an actor. What do you think his best defense is? Well, his best defense is is twofold. One is he had no reason to believe there were live rounds, nor would anyone have reason to believe there were live rounds on the set. And and two, uh, that uh, that although the prosecution's expert is going to testify in a certain manner, that manner being that the firearm couldn't have gone off on its uh, on its own, you know, continuing to insist that he didn't pull the trigger, that it did go off on its own. I mean, if you have a battle of experts and you also have the idea that somebody else was guilty, meaning the armor, Hannah Gutierrez Reed, then you've got a pretty strong defense case there. Yeah, I mean, the jurors, despite what the judge tells them about, you know, more than one person can be found negligent of a crime, they might look at this and say, if not for her negligence, if not for her bringing the live ammunition to the set, there wouldn't have been a death. That's that's exactly right. And I should say this is a very unique case. So I can't say, look, that's how cases are argued all the time. But when you have cases where there are you know, more than one defendant and the defendants were not part of a conspiracy sharing a, the same aim, but rather the defendants are in sort of a chain of negligence, just like a tort case, uh, one defendant is certainly entitled to argue, but for the fact that somebody before on the causation chain didn't do their job right, we wouldn't be here today. Baldwin's attorneys have added one name, Assistant Director Dave Halls, to their witness list. He's the one who pointed the finger at at the armorer when testifying at her trial, claiming she was the one who gave Baldwin the gun. But the police reports state that it was Halls who handed Baldwin the gun. Uh, Are they just going to try to confuse the issue here? Well, you know, that's a possibility. The other possibility is uh, to to show that, you know, that would sort of show that Baldwin had, it's, it's ridiculous for the jury to believe that Baldwin would have known that there was a chance live bullets were in the gun. I mean, if they could show the confusion of the day before it happened, I, I suppose that could lay, you know, that additional idea that he was, he, he, he had no, I, he, no reasonable person in his place would have an idea that there were live rounds on the set. And therefore this is just an unfortunate, you know, accident that resulted in a death. I could see that, but there's, there's one other thing that I think we haven't talked about in regard to the prosecution's list of witnesses, of, of, wit, of witnesses who were on the movie set. You know, one of the things the defense is likely to do and probably has to dance very you know, carefully on this factor is that Baldwin at least has been reported as not a particularly likable guy. And the defense may be able to get through cross-examination the bias of those witnesses that, you know, they're shading their testimony either on purpose or subconsciously because Baldwin's not a likable guy and they don't like him. You know, it's that, that sort of thing can go on as well. And, and that certainly can help Baldwin's case. So the biggest question always in a criminal defense is, will the defendant testify? Baldwin is a movie star who speaks well, and the jurors will want to hear from him. Tell me what you think the upside and the downside of his testimony is. Well, you know, normally defendants don't testify, but it's their choice to do so or not do so. I mean, a defense counsel cannot order a defendant not to testify. I mean, it's, a, it's a fundamental right. So let's suppose for a minute he testifies. The upside is he looks at the jury with a straight face and he tells them, I did not depress the trigger and I only believe there were blanks in that gun and the gun was safety checked and I was told it's fine to go forward with doing what I was doing uh, and, and act remorseful when he does it. I mean, there can be that kind of believability as tailor-made for an acquittal. The, the downside is twofold. One, he has the, you know, he's open to cross-examination and cross-examination could include other instances of, 
um, you know, carelessness on his part. And, and not only the rust set, but if there are other instances of carelessness or a lack of regard for human safety in other movie sets or just, you know, in the walk of life, basically, those may come into evidence to show a pattern. They wouldn't come into evidence against him in all likelihood if they if he didn't testify. But once he testifies, it's possible that he opens up the door to sort of the broad sweep of his life. And I'm not aware of the broad sweep of his life, but sometimes that can be devastating to defendants, and sometimes it doesn't matter. The other uh, downside, possible downside to it is, you know, you mentioned it. He's an actor, and uh, juries, you know, human beings like authenticity. And a defendant who's not authentic, like a, like a victim in a case who's not authentic, or a police officer who's not, can dig their own hole. Thanks so much for joining me, Josh. That's Professor Joshua Kastenberg of the University of New Mexico Law School. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, the senator who loves to trip up judicial nominees with pop legal quizzes. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. Uh, tell, tell me what Article 5 of the Constitution does. Article 5 is not coming to mind at the moment. Okay. How about Article 2? Neither is Article 2. Jarnell B. Yelkengren asked the Biden administration to withdraw her name from consideration for a federal trial court seat in Washington state after that exchange with Republican Senator John Kennedy during her confirmation hearing. The Louisiana senator likes to quiz nominees to the federal bench about legal doctrines and courtroom procedure with questions that have tripped up nominees from both parties. Kennedy manages to get inside the heads of nominees with his quizzes like no other senator does. Joining me is Bloomberg Law's Tiana Headley, who's written about Kennedy's questioning of judicial nominees as if they were law students. How are Senator Kennedy's questions or questioning different from that of other senators? This is a committee of, of a lot of lawyers. There's 15 total on the committee and several others who've been uh, former law professors as well. But uh, Senator Kennedy, both a former law professor, still a lawyer, gets into nominees' heads by asking sort of these, frankly, on-the-spot, very scary questions about the law, about court procedure, about legal doctrine. And he's stumped quite a few nominees over the years. It's been called the Kennedy Quiz? The Kennedy Quiz, the Kennedy Six-Minute Bar Exam, as Chairman Durbin has called it in the past. And just tell us a little bit about Kennedy's background. He was an adjunct law professor at Louisiana State University. He graduated um, law school from the University of Virginia um, and is an Oxford University graduate. And in these questions, you can kind of see that he's not only drawn on that sort of academic background um, from his law school um, and legal education days, but also his experience um, teaching at Louisiana State University posing questions that he told me in a hallway interview that he would expect his, his, his students to know. <laughs> Do these questions cover the gamut like a bar exam would, or are they focused in specific areas? It really runs the gamut where you can expect questions such as, you know, what does the 13th Amendment do? So almost middle school <laughs> uh, civics class to, you know, what's a motion uh, in limine? about uh, courtroom procedure, what's the Brady motion, right, for, you know, turning over evidence that's favorable to a defendant. And last month, did one nominee actually withdraw her name from consideration for a federal trial court seat because of a question he asked? Yes. So, Charnel Bielkengren, um, she was nominated for a trial court seat in Washington state. One might sort of... um, make that connection, right, that the controversy uh, after her confirmation hearing in which she was unable to um, define Articles 5 and 2 of the Constitution, once that hearing um, was over, there was huge backlash, most of it sort of from conservatives to this Biden nominee, 
saying that she, if she can't even, you know, define articles of the Constitution, like, why would she make a good judge, basically? And, you know, she ultimately was not renominated in the new year um, and officially asked the White House to withdraw her name from consideration for the judgeship. There was a similar incident during the questioning of a Trump nominee to the D.C. District Court, and I remember that. He withdrew his name, too. Tell us about that. Yes. So we're going all the way back to uh, 2017. So this was Matthew Peterson, um, the former Federal Election Commission chair, who had very little sort of a practicing litigation background to draw from as far as trying to answer questions about, you know, trials and just legal practice generally. You know, he'd never tried a jury trial either civil or criminal, couldn't define the Dobert standard, if I'm saying that correctly, couldn't define a motion in limine, as I said before. Really, it was a very awkward five minutes of questioning where just time after time again, he either admitted to his lack of, ex- of litigation experience or simply could not answer you know, basic questions that uh, someone with trial experience would be able to answer. Nominees go through extensive preparations for these hearings. How much are these Kennedy quizzes now a part of that? So as far as our understanding of what that prep has looked like over the years, so Kennedy joined the Senate back in 2017. And so the nominees who would have been sort of subject to these quizzes have been Trump and Biden nominees. I was able to talk with some former Justice Department officials under the Trump administration who were in charge of prepping nominees. They said to me that they would sort of go over mock questions that Senator Kennedy might have asked, you know, relating to legal procedure, et cetera. A former official told me that they would hold mock hearings in which staffers would portray different senators, uh, including Kennedy. I I would really love to see that Kennedy (laughs) impression. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But it's really trying to get these nominees in the frame of mind of, you know, answering an on-the-spot mini-bar exam. I'll just add to that, too, as well, that these officials did say that they would sort of generally provide some form of practice for the nominees, but ultimately... You know, it's what has that person done in their professional career that has, you know, prepared them for that moment, right? We're not going to have you study for the bar exam again, but what have you done in your career? What has been your legal practice been that should, in and of itself, prepare you for this moment? And, you know, there's some debates about whether if one does or does not do well on these quizzes, if that really reflects on the breadth of that person's professional experience. But nominees, from district court nominees to Supreme Court nominees, usually steer clear of making commitments to specific legal issues. Does that annoy Kennedy? You know, you'll hear Supreme Court nominees say, well, that may come before me. Kennedy, much like any other senator, understands that they nominees can't say that they will rule this and this way on any particular issue or case. There have been some tense exchanges between nominees. In those exchanges, he'll say, I know the White House has coached you not to answer my question, but I need to know how you think. That's actually uh, a statement that was reflected in, in one of my conversations with a former Department of Justice official who is in charge of prepping nominees that Kennedy does indeed want to understand how nominees think, how they how they think through issues. He's not necessarily looking for commitments on legal matters, on cases that could come before a nominee, but in this sort of Socratic exchange that a, a law professor might have with a student where they're t- talking through a legal issue or a legal doctrine, he does, this Department of Justice official was telling me, he does want an active exchange with the nominee. It seems like he takes delight in his reputation as a hard questioner, sort of like street cred on the (laughs) committee. He did an Instagram reel. Tell me about that. Yeah, so I believe back in December uh, on his Instagram page, he posted a reel that was almost a montage, if you will, of some of his famous moments of questioning Biden nominees over the earlier months of of 2023. 
where you have clips of him questioning, at the time, nominee Cato Cruz for the District of uh, Colorado, Charnel Bjelkengren for the a trial court seat in Washington State. And really, these clips really showcase these nominees being, frankly, very stumped by these questions. And so I think that's a pretty fair reading that he does take some delight in this reputation that he has gained for being a a formidable questioner of nominees. I don't know if formidable is the word. He just goes in areas where other senators don't. And it seems to me, having watched this for a while, that it's like a game for him. And does the inability to answer one legal question show that a nominee is not qualified for the bench? I mean, even Supreme Court justices don't know all the answers. That's one of the reasons they ask all the questions they do at oral arguments. It just seems like it's for show. I think those are all uh, incredibly fair points to make, right? <laughs> In talking with people for this story, one thing that came up was just sort of the nature of the questioning where you have someone sort of sitting down in front of these really bright lights, um, in front of some of the most powerful politicians in the country, and all of a sudden you're asked about this amendment that you probably haven't thought of in a while. <laughs> <laughs> and you're meant to sort of define it on the spot in that moment. And if you don't, you might end up in a highlight reel on Kennedy's Instagram page. You spoke to the Justice Program Director at the Alliance for Justice, and I thought that what he told you really hit home. He said that Kennedy doesn't seem to recognize that judges have access to libraries. And, you know, these questions get briefed, and they have law clerks. Did other people that you spoke to think that this was, you know, not really the best way to approach these hearings? Yes. For the most part, most of the sources I spoke to highlighted the realities, in their view, the realities of what it means to be not just a judge, but to practice the law generally, where it isn't just recalling the memorized quantum of the law, that it is about research, it is about looking through the, the legal questions being presented, it is about, you know, going through case law that you may or may not be familiar with. And all of these very important decisions that judges make um, in the course of of legal practice, in the course of their job, aren't necessarily made on the spot. They're made after countless hours of doing the research, of analyzing legal issues, et cetera. And so I was just talking with some judges, former and current federal judges for a previous story that said, look, most of these cases don't even go to trial, Mm -hmm. right? We don't even have a bench trial or or a jury trial. Much of this is done in, in sort of these motions that are made between parties. A lot of motion practice in the federal courts. Well, it's a really interesting article. Thanks so much, Tiana. That's Tiana Headley of Bloomberg Law. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Show. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news on our Bloomberg Law podcast. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at www.bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. And attorneys looking for legal research? Whether you're an in-house counsel or in private practice, Bloomberg Law gives you the edge with the latest in AI-powered legal analytics, business insights, and workflow tools. With guidance from our experts, you'll grasp the latest trends in the legal industry, helping you achieve better results. For the practice of law, the business of law, the future of law, visit BloombergLaw.com. This is Bloomberg Law on Bloomberg Radio. I'm June Grosso. Stay with us. Today's top stories and global business headlines are coming up right now.